As a result of our use of the Earth, we are damaging it bit by bit, slowly endangering our own living environment. But the Earth is not capable of defending itself. All over the world, lawyers are working to change this, like Scottish Polly Higgins. Why is this not a crime? What is this? How is it that we haven't criminalized mass damage and destruction to the Earth? And Spanish Baltasar Garzón. Hagamos que no sea rentable atacar al planeta. This is backlight. Welcome to a world in which the destruction of the Earth is punishable by law. The Earth. Our Earth. Our living planet. The place where we have built our civilization, which gives us everything we need. The riches of the Earth are the building blocks of our existence. Yet it seems that the harmony between the Earth and its inhabitants is disrupted more and more often. The huge carbon emissions resulting from our exploitation of the Earth are affecting the Earth's atmosphere. Our planet seems to resist our abuse and responds with climate change. The Earth is getting warmer, the polar ice caps are melting, the sea levels are rising, and the consequences are incalculable. The question is, can we as a civilization turn the tide? My name is Polly Higgins. I'm an Earth lawyer. I, so you could say that my client is the Earth. This is Polly Higgins. Five years ago, she gave up her law practice in order to fully devote herself to the rights of the Earth. And this starts with the question, is the damage we are inflicting on the Earth permissible? I remember when five years ago, five, six years ago, when I, was, I, I first was engaging in a very big way with um, the whole idea of how do we create a legal duty of care. And I'd come up with, the, my starting point had been a universal declaration of Earth rights, or planetary rights. And why is it that if we've got a universal declaration of human rights, why don't we have the equivalent for the Earth? I find myself thinking the earth is in need of a good lawyer. <laughs> and it, it was a thought that didn't leave me because the earth and communities right across the world, their voices aren't being heard. And I, I was recognizing that actually nobody was representing the interests of the earth as such in a courtroom. It's rather like representing, you know, for instance, in child care cases, you represent a child. Now, a two-year-old cannot give you an eloquent sentence as to what their needs are and how they're being harmed, but you can bring in a guardian ad litem that speaks on their behalf, and the indicators are there. So, for instance, a child who's been physically harmed is covered in bruises and cuts or, or has uh, brain damage. You know, this, this can be actually scientifically shown. And it's rather the same with the Earth. You can actually show scientifically that there's harm at play. You just have to look at images of the Athabasca tar sands to see that that land has been completely destroyed. We, we can actually evaluate that. We can see it and then have someone speak on behalf in court. So this is not such a radical idea because we already do that within childcare cases. There are more people who came up with the idea of making environmental damage punishable by law. And by no means the least is Baltazar Garzón, a feared Spanish examining magistrate. He gained international fame when he charged former Chilean dictator Augusto Pinochet with crimes against humanity. He litigated against corrupt politicians and currently acts as Julian Assange's spokesperson. And now he is targeting his next big opponent, the multinational companies responsible for damaging the earth. Together with his daughter, he runs the Balthazar Garzon Foundation, which helps countries and communities defend themselves against damage to their living environment. Porque tenemos que tratar de, de peor manera a ese planeta. En definitiva, los derechos humanos del de planeta de la naturaleza son nuestros propios derechos. Si el planeta se destruye como lo estamos haciendo con un sistema económico capitalista brutal, salvaje, al final estamos atentando contra 
nosotros mismos. Nosotros formamos parte del planeta. La naturaleza y los seres humanos somos uno. There's something out of kilter here, desperately out of kilter, with our laws and our legislation, where we're living in a world in the 21st century and we're causing, by dint of human activity, ever more increasing damage and destruction. So what I was seeing was that existing law was not fit for purpose. Existing environmental law uh, is clearly not fit for purpose. So I recognised there was missing law. How do we create a legal duty of care for the earth? How is it that corporations, uh, transnational organisations, are making lots of money out of causing mass damage and destruction to the earth? And I'm thinking about heavy extractive industries, the, the energy industries. We've actually normalised harm. We give permits to pollute. Whose interests are being protected there? The polluter, not the, the community that's adversely impacted. Hoy día lo que sucede es que muchos de los ataques a la naturaleza, muchos de los, de los ataques medioambientales, ni siquiera están previstos como hechos ilícitos. O lo pueden estar a nivel local. Pero si la agresión es transnacional, si la agresión se produce a través de unas explotaciones abusivas, o masivas por corporaciones multinacionales, hay muchos ámbitos que quedan en la impunidad. And I was speaking in Copenhagen at the climate negotiations in 2009, and it, it had been opened up to the audience asking questions. Someone in the audience said, we need a new language to deal with this mass damage and destruction. And this was like a light bulb moment. I found myself thinking, yeah, this is like genocide, only it's eco-side. Wow, that should be a crime. Why is this not a crime? What is this? How is it that we haven't criminalized mass damage and destruction to the earth? We shall now hear an address by the Prime Minister of Sweden, His Excellency Mr. Olof Palme. The idea of ecocide as a crime is not new. In 1972, Olof Palme, then Prime Minister of Sweden, gave a fiery speech in which he tried to put ecocide on the international agenda. During the Vietnam War, the United States engaged in large-scale destruction of nature by using the defoliant Agent Orange. The air we breathe is not the property of any one nation. We share it. What is asked of us is not to relinquish our national sovereignty, but to use it to further the common good, to leave something for us and future generations to share. The immense destruction brought about by indiscriminate bombing, sometimes described as ecocide, which requires urgent international attention. Our future is common. We must share it together. We must shape it together. Following in Palmer's footsteps, Polly Higgins has launched a global campaign to introduce an ecocide act. The Swedish environmental movement has invited her to breathe new life into Olaf Palmer's old idea. Your human right to life is protected on a one-to-one -one by the crime of murder or homicide. If it's you and your community that are under threat of being killed, then the crime is genocide. But what about the Earth's right to life? How do we protect and govern that? I, I went down that rabbit hole of rigorous legal scrutiny could this be an international crime? What are the existing international crimes? Well, we've got genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. Now we have crimes of aggression. It was put in place in 2010. You know, what if we had ecocide as an international crime? What criminal law does is it reframes what we choose within society to be acceptable or unacceptable. 
We have a phrase in law, a term, an old Latin term that we use for this. When malum in se becomes malum prohibita, when something is so wrong in and of itself, we prohibit it. And that's what we do with criminal law. We say, enough, no more, you can't do that, it's a crime. And we close the door to it. Where Balthazar Garzon directly targets big companies, Higgins is building an international network in order to create widespread support for ecocide as a crime. When I talk with CEOs, you know, we, we confront them, it's like, you know, this remark, well, it's not illegal. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and what can you say? You can tell them, well, but it's not moral. Yeah. But it's like, you know, they just grin at you. It's like, so what? You can't touch me. You yeah. can't touch me. Mm. And I think that's... And, and Michael Baumgartner works for Greenpeace, and on behalf of Greenpeace Switzerland, he is exploring the possibilities of putting ecocide legislation on the general public's agenda. It's not a, a crime of, you know, a CEO wanting to destroy land. Exactly. We're not interested in that. Exactly. But we're interested in what happens when, you know, you just recklessly want to generate profit. Yeah. yeah. Without any interest in the consequences. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And, and how to hold those at the very top end accountable. I think that's a very crucial thing. Mm -hmm. Bringing it back to those, you know, multinational corporations have thousands of people employed, but they don't have all, not all of them have the same power, actually. It's very few holding the power signing these projects off mm. that we're actually then fighting mm. so, and holding those people responsible. And mm. I think that's really the power of a criminal law. Because mm. mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you know, I mean, people think twice when they personally can go to jail for what they're mm. signing off. Absolutely. That that's different from just shareholders having to pay up to, to pay the bill mm. if a company gets sued or a company even gets closed. Mm. For what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, but the thing with criminal law is, it's, it's. I mean, that that it's true. The difference between this and a lot of these civil actions and all the public interest stuff as well, is that it's the limit. This is the threshold where you can't go anymore. Yeah. This is this is the yeah. limit on human behaviour. Yeah. This is where it is really violent. Bronwyn Lay, environmental lawyer from Australia, is conducting countless lawsuits between companies, governments, and citizens. And one of the things I like about EcoSide. It's through the law bringing a sensitivity to this violence that we do to the world, yeah. which we humans, we, we, we just, we've evacuated that in some respects. Yeah. But we feel it. Yeah. Like, we feel that. And that's why the, the, the call towards ecocide is a call to that. It's criminalised because that's the limit. Prior enemigo es la indiferencia. Es decir, este no es mi problema. No. Este es nuestro problema. Y si todos pensamos que este es nuestro problema... Puede ser que aquellos que defiendan esa postura sean tachados de megalómanos, de locos, de que atacan a las estructuras del sistema económico. Y yo me pregunto, ¿quién está atacando más a las estructuras del sistema económico? ¿Qué se entiende por sistema económico? Se entiende el bienestar, se, se entiende el buen vivir, se entiende la defensa de unos principios básicos de convivencia. Se entiende la lucha contra la desigualdad. Si es que estamos hablando de otra cosa, llevarán razón, pero yo entiendo que ese es el verdadero sistema económico. Por tanto, lo que estamos haciendo es defender un sistema económico responsable, racional, integrador, y ni siquiera estamos atacando al propio sistema capitalista, ¿no?, Lo que estamos diciendo es no a cualquier precio. No hay por qué seguir extrayendo masivamente, incluso utilizando mecanismos como el fracking o como otras técnicas, eh, el petróleo, todos los recursos naturales con una extracción masiva, sin control, destruyendo los propios hábitats ancestrales de pueblos originarios, es decir, es como una mecánica que los técnicos, que los científicos tienen descrita perfectamente. Es decir, no se van a renovar. Polly Higgins was invited to visit the last true indigenous people of Europe, the Sami. They are scattered across four countries: Norway, Finland, Russia, and Sweden an area better known as Lapland. 
Sweden, uh, I think, is a particularly interesting thing because they also have an indigenous culture there that's under threat, the, the Samai. And the, here within Europe, we have a, an indigenous culture still living off the land where the land really matters to them and they're now being threatened with super mining, um, ma major mining uh, that could destroy vast tracts of their territory. And this is an opportunity for me to meet direct those individuals who are whose land is under threat, whose way of living with their land is under threat. So this is the cultural ecocide. This is Marie Persson. She and her husband are real laps, living a modern life, but in perfect harmony with nature. This balance has been disrupted for years by soil contamination caused by old nickel mines. An ecocide act could offer her and the other Sami protection against the destruction of their habitat. Uh, here is one part of the mining project. There are no buildings here. They are this canyon and this you see how they have been digging in the landscape, taking out forest and everything. The whole project, uh, it, it, um, it ended after one and a half year, it was bankruptcy, totally. <laughs> we see here the canyon, mm. because they didn't uh, mine here for long at all. Mm. But uh, the fact is, is that this is causing so much environmental trouble yeah. since because when the company went bankrupt, they just went and left it. It was left abandoned. Yeah, it just, they just left. And both here and in Bleiken, they have been l leaking so much metals into the water. Mm. They didn't think that it would affect the environment so much, so they had a quite high a limit in the permit. Mm. They were permitted to to uh, <clears throat> uh, let out 500 kilo, kilograms of zinc a year. Mm -hmm. But when it was the worst, the leakage, leakage both mm -hmm. here and in Bleiken, they uh, they went. Um, the leakage was 200 kilograms a day. Oh wow! Yeah, that's huge. That's really, really yeah. a lot. So this spot is now one of the prior main priorities for the environmental uh, organizations here yeah. to, to clean up or to try to stop this process. But we see here, when we see the rock, yeah. we see the process is going on. <laughs> to, oh. Now we have a lot of snow. Yeah. So if we would go here in the summer or uh, when the snow is gone, you should see this moon landscape mm. in this area. Mm. Oh, don't go so near. We have there, you can see. You mm. see the color of it? Yeah. It's the metals that uh, they're just laying here and, and pollute the area. And then we have the other mine where they're just pumping the water to prevent it from going out in, in the river. Estamos en una especie de guerra contra el, del sistema económico contra la naturaleza y de una defensa que estamos reclamando desde la naturaleza, es decir, desde la propia humanidad, contra ese sistema económico. Es, es, es una locura. Es decir, sabemos que nos estamos destruyendo y sin embargo continuamos avanzando de una forma imparable. Bien, pues para tratar de, en el ámbito de la jurisdicción penal, de la jurisdicción civil internacional, de avanzar, lo que hemos hecho es poner eh, en reflexión una serie de, eh, de hechos, experiencias y dar un paso más. Es decir, hay crímenes de esta naturaleza que son auténticos crímenes de lesa humanidad. Sin lugar a dudas, Ataques a determinados ecosistemas y demás pueden ser parte de crímenes de guerra, pero en sí mismos considerados no están catalogados todavía. Lo que queremos es conseguir que ese debate se produzca, 
que esos crímenes económicos, financieros y medioambientales adquieran, cuando afectan a una colectividad de personas, adquieran la categoría de crímenes de lesa humanidad, aquí no estamos en esa, en esa tesitura. Lo que estamos pidiendo es una responsabilidad real, es decir, una reflexión de que estamos acabando con nuestro sistema de vida porque estamos destruyendo el planeta. Y a quien lo está haciendo, incluso se le premia, incluso se le considera que es un, un gran líder económico y demás. No, no podemos hacer. El recurso en la jurisdicción penal es el último recurso, pero también tenemos que establecer mecanismos de sanción, porque si al fin y al cabo lo que interesa aquí es el beneficio, como parece ser, bueno, pues ataquemos al beneficio. Hagamos que no sea rentable atacar al planeta. Are you seeing at all um, judgments coming through saying there's missing law? The law is so prescribed around this battle between economics and the environment, and they have to take the side of economics often, mm. often that there is no room for the registrars or the tribunal members or the judges to do that necessarily. That prevents them from actually giving justice in a, in a court case. Yes, but you can, when you read it, you can feel the frustration in the judgments as well. Yeah. But even in terms of one of the things that changes law, and has always changed law, is disasters. And we're heading into like a whole possible future of lots of lots of disasters, mm -hmm. which is a terrible thing. But in history, that's where law has just shifted really fast. The science is in that we are having an, an incredible penetrative kind of effect on on weather, on climate. And when these things happen, we don't know what the cause is. It's not necessarily the natural movements of the Earth. It is beyond what's natural. It's us. Law must have a deeper response because we're there in the Earth as it moves in this revengeful act towards us. So have we, is the Earth kicking against us, or is us, our movement into the Earth coming back at us? And I think that's where ecocide is really a, a contemporary law that addresses the neo-natural disaster. We're living in a really good time in lots of respects. We're at the, maybe at the end of it. And so how do we preserve that? Have we gone too far? So thinking, thinking is really important, being really careful about what we're doing and being, that's why Ecoside says stop. We need to introduce into the public what is an Ecoside. We, have, we all have the images of Ecoside. We see them on TV all the time, but we don't make the link yet, the word Ecoside and those images. So we need to create that and we, we also need to put forward the solution, ecocide law. I hope that more people realize, you know, we're, we're making history here, so get involved. But the, the main issue of the planned nickel mining project here is the environmental uh, one and the, uh, the rights of the uh, indigenous people yeah. of the Sami, yeah. No mining project has ever been stopped in Sweden in the, in the last uh, environmental assessment. In, mm. And here is my father. <laughs> it's getting worse for the Laps. The Swedish government has issued a permit for a new nickel mine in the middle of their habitat. <laughs> King Knut. <laughs> Marie's father, Knut Persson, leads us to the place where the new mine will be built. Existing law puts the interests of the shareholder first, yeah. by law. So a company has to do that. And of course that means maximizing profit. Yeah. I, uh, with very little regard for, for any other you know, member of the, the community that can be adversely impacted. So you could sit on a board of directors and say, hey, I don't feel too good about this mining project. I think this is going to pollute the water and you know, cause great atmospheric pollution. It's going to be really disastrous for these local Samis and their, their reindeer. And you know, hey, the people downstream 200 kilometers away, it's going to be really significantly 
I fed their their drinking water, you know, all this sort of stuff. Yeah. What about future generations? <laughs> and you know, and you, you, you know, the, the CEO will sit there and the lawyer advising will say, that's all fine and well, but your legal duties to your shareholders, you're going to maximize your profit. You know, don't worry about that. That's not a legal requirement. So this causes problems. Um, when this, wow. Wow. This is amazing. At this part of our municipality, we have a, a very uh, big region, a big uh, municipality called mm -hmm. Storuman. And this uh, uh, part here in the west, we live. We are dependent on the nature and on the uh, tourism and everything. That people, mm -hmm. they come to work here or to live here and to stay here because of this, mm -hmm. because of the nature. Mm -hmm. So it's like cutting off the um, legs or something. Mm -hmm. and what are your feelings about mining happening here? Not very lost. It's really bad. Very left, total. They will destroy uh, the whole valley of Björkvartsdalen. This is such a pristine environment. It's hard to envisage what it would be like mm -hmm. yeah. to have it despoiled by mining. Mm. And uh, where they are planning this huge nickel mine is Right here. Right here. Right here. Where, here. We stand. where we stand. Yeah. Okay. They have been drilling. If it wasn't uh, all this snow, we would see the, the drilling, the holes yeah. where they have been. We know that they will mine nickel, iron and cobalt. But we also know that uh, results of the, the cores contains asbestos. You know what I'm hearing here is a, a really sad tale that I hear many countries, many continents right across the world, where beautiful pristine land, I mean, look at this magnificent landscape, is under threat of development. Uh, development that promises jobs, uh, promises money into the economy, the national economy, but at what price? And actually, it's not something you can put a price on. So in a way, what we have here are a few key people who are able to stand up and speak out as earth protectors, if you like. You know, they are the guardians of this land. And indeed, they are the ancient guardians of this land. But because they don't have a contract, because they don't have a piece of paper that has their name signing off on it, then other people can make decisions as to what happens here, regardless of what those who live in this land have to say, because their voice isn't being heard. The Sami who live here, the land itself, once it's gone, it's gone. You know, it can never be returned. And there's a term for this that when culturally a community is destroyed through development, it's called solostalgia. I, when it's a collective trauma at play of the loss that can never be returned, of the damage and destruction that actually carries on through generations. Like nostalgia, but with solace. Solace is the pain of the heart. But are they doing fracking already? Or have they detected it already? Because from what they told us in Torres, the issue of Plus Petrol was in Bolivia. Where was it? In Bolivia? Where was it? In Peru? Y exactamente que es una, es una explotación ilegal de, de, para extracción. Y provoca desplazamientos o que provocan el, para el, el, los pueblos quechua. Pues provoca sobre todo conflictos sociales. 
Ah, bueno, sí, el de la etnia, el de, la etnia de Bangladesh. Estoy orgullosa de él como persona, ¿no? O sea, como si yo lo mirara desde fuera, evidentemente estoy orgullosa de que sea mi padre, pero independientemente de que sea mi padre, porque para mí es un visionario, si no piensas a lo grande, te quedas en nada. Estoy orgullosa de él en el sentido de que no, se, no tiene miedo, tira para adelante, hace las cosas. En el caso de los crímenes de la tierra ya existen precedentes, ¿no? De, claro, el caso de los crímenes económicos cometidos por las grandes corporaciones, todavía no. Por ejemplo, una extractora, una compañía americana que hace extracciones irregulares en, en un país de Centroamérica o de Latinoamérica y con ello lo que está haciendo es... Eh, me, eh, en vez de hacer, deshacerse los residuos correctamente, los está enterrando bajo la tierra, etc. Que las comunidades que viven en esa tierra pues han sufrido, eh, pueden sufrir envenenamientos, pueden sufrir desplazamientos, pueden sufrir incluso en casos en, en la Amazonía ha habido mafias que mataban a la gente para que pudieran entrar las, las compañías extractoras. Es decir, se, se está creando una serie de eh, consecuencias sobre la población que podría, estar pensado, se podría catalogar como en un plan sistemático, en el sentido de que no ya sistemático, sino que ataña a un sector de la población. Polly Higgins es una former uh, business lawyer en London. Uh, she is currently spearheading a campaign uh, to bring a law of ecocide as the fifth crime against humanity and ultimately nature. It's great to have you here at our conference. Thank you. Please give Polly a big okay, hand. Thank you very much. Hello. Lovely to be here. Thank you. Hi. We're 700 people. Everyone works with legislation here. Oh, wow. So you're <laughs> at your home turf, okay? Please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. What a delight to be in a room with 700 people who enjoy law. <laughs> what myself and, and a group of others are doing is we're seeking out not just one but a group of heads of state who can stand up and call for this and say, okay, now we want this document amended. There's a missing international crime here, a missing fifth crime, and that is ecocide, and we now call for that to be tabled. Because, of course, heads of states are, you know, the representatives of nations. They're there to speak on behalf of their people as well, and not just for those who are alive here and today, but for future generations. This is a legacy issue, if you like, and it's a collective responsibility that civilization as a whole holds on our shoulders. Um, some of us may not know it, but in fact we do, you know, hold a responsibility for ourselves and for future generations to ensure that we leave this world a better place, not a worse place. The interesting thing is, is that ecocide law was actually born... After Olaf Palmer's speech, a committee was set up to write a legislative text for crimes against the environment. This text was included in the draft bill for crimes against humanity. In 1996, this Ecocide Act would have been passed. He berated the United Nations for dragging their feet uh, when it came to ecocide and calling on nations to put in place laws to end the ecocide. So this, this is not new. You know, uh, when we look back into the annals of time, it's there and very nearly became an international crime in the 1990s. And it was only at the 11th hour that it was removed. By 1996, 11 years later, when there was really a large body of support for it, at a closed door meeting in the United Nations for the Working Group on Crimes Against the Environment, it was announced by the then head of the Working Group that ecocide law was going to be removed. Many countries stood up to object to this and demanded reasons. None were given. And ecocide was removed as a crime. There are records from the then UN rapporteurs who were involved in that meeting. And obviously they, they, they decided to put in a record of what their opinion was of what happened and they logged it into the United Nations basement. And we've now discovered these documents. And what they said was that four, maybe five countries had, in their opinion, lobbied behind the scenes to have it removed. Which countries? US, UK, France and the Netherlands. This was as a result of vested corporate interests who had vested reason um, 
to not have this law put in place so that they could continue with business as usual. Thank you very much for coming to our conference, Milia Thank, Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank you very much Thank for you. being here. Thank you. And I realise that to stop vested interests um, doing the same again, it was very important that this proposal remain in the public domain. Idag så besöker en känd miljöjurist, gruvaktivist till Västerbotten, Polly Higgins från England ska föreläsa i Umeå om sina krav på ny lagstiftning. Uh, Polly, we already have environment legislation, laws against polluting uh, in Sweden. Uh, isn't that enough? No, it's not. And uh, we know it's not enough. What we're seeing here is that when significant harm plays out to a community, it's down to the community to take action. So an individual or a group of people have to sue a company. And of course, often when things do go wrong, the company's gone bankrupt. And then nobody is, is accountable in this process. I, I had no idea of where to take this. But actually, by putting it out in the public domain, It, it, it attracted energy straight back in. So suddenly I had uh, you know, people from across the world contacting me, lawyers and non-lawyers. And it, it became very clear to me that it, actually I was going to have to take this out to every country in the world. Yo he crecido con un padre que estaba amenazado por tanta gente y aquí estamos. O sea, yo he tenido escolta, él ha tenido, por supuesto, yo he, yo he crecido con policías en mi casa, en mi, quiero decir, y nunca, y puede pasar, pero si, no, si estás pensando en lo que pueda pasar, no haces nada. Y a mí lo que me han enseñado es que hay que hacerlo. Entonces, nosotros aquí en España estamos con el tema del franquismo, con lo cual tenemos a toda la derecha eh, en nuestra contra. Con todo este tema de los crímenes eh, económicos, etcétera, estamos contra las grandes corporaciones, contra... Pero es que si no lo haces tú, no lo hace nadie. O sea, tienes que... Y, y yo sería, sería contrario a mi naturaleza no, no hacerlo. Y ahora esta semana... Evidentemente siempre va a ser difícil. Es decir, si combates por la paz, quien fabrica las armas o las vende ilegalmente va a estar en contra tuya. Y puede incluso acabar con tu vida. Bueno, pero merece la pena esa lucha. O los Palmé murió por una idea. ¿no? In advance of the climate summit in Paris, there are preparatory meetings where the agreements to fight global warming are being discussed. Armed with a draft Ecocide Act, Polly Higgins is looking for representatives of the small island states. These small island groups, mainly in the Pacific, are likely to be flooded when the sea levels rise. This is also included in the definition of ecocide, because rising sea levels are caused by human action. This act could give the endangered islands legal protection. Hi. Hi, I'm Polly Higgins. Hi. Hi. I'm Olai. You know, Palau is actually outside of the typhoon belt, so one of the things that we noticed over the past few years is that we've gotten more frequent typhoons, um, more intense over the last few years. I mean, we began with like Bofa, yeah. and then after Haiyan, yeah. so before it reached the Philippines, it reached Palau first, and yeah. we had um, one of our atolls totally destroyed, and so that's the recent one that we've been really having uh, to, to ensure that uh, we get more prepared. Yeah. Um, infrastructurally to, to handle those kind of impacts uh, that um, for so many years we didn't foresee. To get the law onto the United Nations agenda, she needs the support of a head of state, one who dares to propose the law. 
Have you heard about the ecocide law proposal that's been put forward to some small island state? No, I have not heard. This is to create a legal duty of care to give assistance uh, preemptively for small island states. Any significant adverse impact from whatever happens within climate change and what it would do rather than going through a negotiations process actually puts in place a legally binding law with legal teeth in the International Criminal Court with powers to prosecute. Okay, I have Rainier from Nauru, the world's smallest republic. Rainier, lovely to meet you. I'm Polly Higgins. We have here the work of Ecoside Law. Uh, What's that work? Ecoside Law. Ecoside. Ecoside. Shall I tell you a little bit about yeah, yeah, it? Yeah, tell me a little bit. So this is an international law that's been proposed. Okay, there you are. And importantly for you guys is it creates a legal duty of care to give assistance mm -hmm. for you when you have naturally occurring ecocide, rising sea levels and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. We, we certainly we would need to look at that yeah. and uh, if you have any uh, information uh, by you email this. you can forward it to yeah. me so that I can circulate to the group this and then um, they can have a look yeah. at it. We need a head of state and preferably a, a group of heads of state to call for this law. Now, this is very important because all I'm requiring is, is an amendment to the Rome Statute. That's all that's required for it to then be put in place as an international law. So the Rome Statute is an international codification document and 123 countries are now signatories to that document. Uh, they've ratified it, and so that means they've applied it, they've implemented it into their own legal system. And it supersedes all other national laws. So there's a hierarchy of law here. International criminal law, if you like, is at the very top end. All that's required is for one head of state to stand up and say, as a signatory to the Rome Statute, I call for ecocide law to be tabled. Pero, pero es que es, el tema es que hay que hay que contar con un país para que lo introduzca. ¿Argentina? ¿Eh? No, Argentina no lo va a hacer de momento. Tendría que ser, por ejemplo, Ecuador o podría ser... Pero ya es el día 10 de eh, octubre. octubre, con lo cual vamos tarde. ¿Cuándo, eso, ¿cuándo y yo tengo una entrevista en esa fecha, el 10, no, el 11, con el presidente Evo Morales. Uh -huh donde vamos a hablar de todos los temas de los, de los derechos de la madre tierra y derechos de la naturaleza, el desarrollo. Bolivian President Evo Morales wants to include the rights of the earth in his country's constitution, which could serve as an example to the rest of the world. Meanwhile, Polly Higgins and Michael Baumgartner have an appointment with the Swedish Minister for the Environment, Orsa Romsen. Sweden played an important role in enacting the Rome Statute, which established the existing crimes against peace, so it's the obvious country to make the next leap forward. The starting point is to get a head of state or a group of heads of state to call for this law. The wheels then start turning. If we don't get that point running, the rest won't happen. And we believe there's a window of opportunity this year to do this. Now we are again yeah. heavily engaged, of course, in the international uh, climate negotiations, yeah. but that's also very, kept, uh, this year, very, very connected to the processes of the UN or the sustainability goals. At yeah, the moment. absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and that sense of urgency that we, we see is growing within certain member states. I, to, to really see if there's another avenue that can mm -hmm. be taken yeah. to address that. The, the international legal community recognise that the, this is the next big quantum leap in where law will go, that it's missing law, that it's just a matter of time until it's put in place. Right. It's really interesting yeah. you say that there is actually some uh, some state support for the discussion, in, oh, yeah. also in the Rome Statute, because as, as, as we speak last time, I was, I was a bit sceptical that that would be uh, um, a space that existed actually in, in real politics at yeah. the moment, maybe mm -hmm. it would come, but, but uh, if it has opened, that's really yeah. interesting. And yeah. I think Sweden, with the, you know, the legacy of Olaf Palme, I mean, that would be obviously yeah. a wonderful yeah. state to step forward. Yeah. I should uh, talk to my colleagues at the Foreign Department. It's, I know that Isabella Levine, that you yeah. also have been, been yes. That'd be great. when she was a parliamentarian in the yeah. European Parliament. And, and I mean, she knows about the ecocide yes. and, and now she's, she's that would be wonderful. Head, of, head of the uh, foreign, uh, foreign Aid yes. Office, so that's so. Uh, part of the Foreign Office. I think this was really good um, because... Uh, she 
raised it herself. Yes. Fabulous. But more than that, actually, Michael, is great because she's also wanting to engage with other actors and all of this. Yeah, so she's speaking very much to you. And I really I want this to be something that is not just one lawyer with mm. a single cause. It has to come from other people. Yeah. And when it comes from other people, I'm no longer required. I can step back and, and allow others to move forward. So I this is about creating I, the safe space. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's why I raised that there are other initiatives. Yeah, you know, we're exactly. not, this is not, this Very is not. Important. I think that's important to know. And you know, yeah. I didn't mention universities. I could have, I should have maybe. But oh. the, the, you know, but again, that's br making them realize this is not just In isolation. One, yeah, it's, yeah. Not it's not in just isolation. No, idea we need to engage with this, yeah. full stop. And it's moving so fast. Yeah, yeah. and I mean, I'm so happy that you actually raised, said, you know, I'm going to speak to my, to the, my colleague, the other minister. That's, yes, <laughs> it's better, you know, that's what I hope for. <laughs> that they, they bring it up themselves. I think there's a window of opportunity here that we can use to move forward here. We've got the climate negotiations here in Europe and Paris. There, there's a window of opportunity to say there is another way here. Climate negotiations, 21 years on, it's not working. There's something that can, there's another way possible here that can actually take us to a safer place. And decoside law is that. Todos somos responsables, pero ustedes, señores y señoras presidentes de los países líderes del mundo, tienen la obligación de exigir y de adoptar las medidas para salvar al planeta. Todos, insisto, somos responsables. Protect the wild, tomorrow's child. Protect the land from the greed of man. Take out the dams, stand up to oil. Protect the plants and renew the soil. Who's gonna stand up and save the earth? Who's gonna say that she's had enough? Who's gonna take on the big machine? Who's gonna stand up and save the earth? This all starts with you and me.